I'm awfully pleased to be able to introduce Molly Burkle. It's Berkeley. Uh, it Berkeley. Berkeley. I'm sorry. Berkeley. <laughs> Berkeley. University of. And, uh, like and we have a crew here. And uh, one of the things we were going to do is go around the room and have everybody say their name and why they're here. So I'm Susan Sedgwick, and I'm here because I'm, I'm really curious about all the things that have to be done when, um, well, I'm, I'm doing this for my husband, so when he finds me dead in the bed some morning, he'll know what to do. So I've got to come up with a list of things for him to do. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just for the camera. Oh, it's just for the camera. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Janet Reedy, and um, I've, I've read some about green burial, and I find it really interesting, but it also sort of daunting I don't quite know how to get started and go through the steps that that it would take and so I'm interested in learning more about it I'm Sheridan Harvey I have a small plot at Congressional Cemetery but then I learned about green burial are you willing to dig a seven-foot hole and put me straight down uh, <laughs> probably not well anyway I, will, I think I'll get cremated, but anyway, I wanted to learn more. Hi, I'm, I'm Ann Goodwin. I'm just here to hear about some of the options. I'm Gina Reno, and likewise, I'm eager to hear about what our choices are. I'm Lee Reno. Um, I never thought about being buried in a cemetery, uh, but the more I go around, a congressional cemetery and see friends. <laughs> I said, well, maybe I'd like to join them. <laughs> well, so I'm Lisa Gregory, and uh, I always thought I'd be cremated, but I learned there's other options, and I'm just here to, to hear more about that. Hi, I'm Bill Matazeski, known as Mr. Mary Proctor to some of you. Uh, <laughs> I uh, am here because I am very interested in being composted, and uh, I'm, uh, I have uh, uh, 21 gardens in Vermont, and I want my body spread over all of them so that my children continue to care for them. <laughs> I'm Cece Albert, and I came because I'm just curious about what kinds of things are happening in this area right now. My name is Kay Jax, and I think I've decided on cremation, but I have like a little, well, I mean, you could guide me. I've told my daughter I want her to get little ginger jars, put colorful sand in the jars, and hand them out to people I love. And uh, she's good for that, but she's like, you think you've got it bad? My mom wants me to do, you know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, but I've heard of different things like the composting. I've heard shot out of a cannon. So I'm interested in all the... <laughs> I'm interested in options. Well, I, I'm reconnecting, and Lily uh, told me she's a new employee at uh, Congressional. Um, and I'm picking up, me and my wife, Judy, are picking up from... Am I on? Am I having any sound? Uh, yeah, it's going to the camera. Just for the oh, okay, mic. got it. Anyway, um, she and I, Judy and I had agreed, approaching 80, that it was time for us to talk uh, funeral arrangements. Uh, and we uh, called Congressional Cemetery to make an appointment. Unfortunately, we called in March 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for some reason, they said, no, we're, we're not going to talk for a while. So I'm reinitiating the connection. I'm Ann Manheimer. I also called Congressional during March 2, 2020 because <laughs> there was time to do it. And, um, I'm attracted to it because I know it's a pet friendly cemetery so I'm hoping me and the remains of all of my dogs from the past from my life can um, be together um, in a pet friendly place and um, I'm debating between that and actually the um, reef ball that will attach to the coral reef out off the coast of um, the eastern shore so that would be very nice either way um, and if you have any tips on how to get to the top of the list to walk your dog in the cemetery uh, while I'm still alive that would also be appreciated <laughs> Uh, 
That's why I'm going to find out. <laughs> I'm Lily Berkeley, as Susan introduced, and I'm, I think, on day five at Congressional. So <laughs> I'll do my best. It's so nice to be among so many people who love Congressional and who are already planning to be there. Um, I have a funeral home background, so I'm a funeral director, mortician person, um, licensed embalmer, although I, I truly don't embalm, but you can ask me embalming questions if you want. Um, and I've been in the death world for about seven years now. Um, I can't imagine doing anything else, and I really love being able to answer your questions, your dying questions. Um, so of course. just, you know, raise your hand or interrupt. I'll pass the mic because I want you to ask. Sometimes people come to these things because their mom's on hospice or they have a like a real serious what do I do when this happens question. So I want to make sure you get those answered. Um, but, it, you know, there's always lots of laughs in these conversations, uh, too. So. I did give you guys a handout. We'll talk from it, and um, we'll just get started. So, uh, yes, does everybody have one? Did they speak over there? Yes, they did. Oh, well, they did. Before you sat down. Okay. Do you have anything other than black clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't wear black a lot, and then today I wore it, and I thought, oh, shoot, they're going to think I wear black all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I, I, I have other... But Bill, she carries it off with the shoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a whole and, different statement. And the toes. <laughs> so uh, this is slides from a PowerPoint. We will go through them together, but ask me questions. Um, that first slide is of me. I know for a fact that way I was, that day I was on my way to um, Gate of Heaven, which is a Catholic cemetery all the way up Georgia Avenue, and they were the strictest during COVID. Um, so I was always just alone with the casket. There was never anyone else there but me. And um, those were the dark days that I do not miss at all from the pandemic. Uh, they would, their crew would come out in hazmat suits, spray, the, spray the, cla the casket down with bleach, and then literally drop it immediately the minute I got there and no one was allowed inside. No matter what they died of. During COVID, yes. Yeah, so everybody suffered, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, that was rough. Um, so what will you do with your body? And I know people like to talk about the mushroom suits being blown out of a cannon. I will say most of the time at the funeral home, those conversations never come up in the real moment. <laughs> and so I like to talk about what happens in the, in the real moment. Um, and I always say the most cutting edge thing you can do when it comes to death is to know what you want, have a general plan, tell your family or your people in your life, and have it written down, have it in a file. That is like the most cutting edge thing you can do because so many people just don't do those very basics. Um, so I think to make the conversation meaningful, if you all could imagine somebody that this information applies to today, whether it's yourself or pick somebody in your family or your life who you think this could be the most helpful for, because I think you'll ask more specific questions if you can kind of think through who that person is. Um, but I want us to just take a minute and let's pretend like death has occurred, okay? Um, so who, who do you call, what do you do in those first, like very first moments? Let's talk about where you are. Um, you've got your person in mind. So if you're, if you're at home on hospice care, hopefully you're on hospice care if you're at home, and that's, it's really important to be on hospice care because it makes these first calls much easier on the people who are present. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But your first call if you're on hospice care is to the hospice nurse. That's who your first call is to. Uh, the hospice nurse will come out and pronounce you. And after you've been pronounced, um, that's when you can make your call to the funeral home or you can have the hospice nurse call the funeral home for you. Um, if you are not under hospice and you die at home or somewhere else unexpectedly, that first call is going to be to 911. Um, so 
if you're at home and you have to call 911, when the police come, they are approaching that. That's a scene for them. They're coming to a scene. And so it has a different flavor at the end. Even if this was somebody who maybe had a lot of health problems and it's not totally unexpected, um, you know, they're, they're going to come and inspect the scene and make sure that everything seems okay. Um, and if they can identify a physician who is willing to sign a death certificate, then they'll say, okay, we've checked this out, now you can call the funeral home. Sometimes they stay on the scene and sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's just you with your person and then you're trying to figure out who to call. Um, so that can have a different feeling at the end. I highly recommend being under hospice care. It just changes, it makes that, those moments right after death happens just a little bit softer, a little bit kinder on the living. Um, if you're at a nursing home, uh, you know, they're going to pronounce you there. Um, if, you're in, you know, if you're at the hospital, obviously you're going to be under medical care. You're going to be taken down to the morgue at some point. And um, how long you have before you have to be picked up by the funeral home depends on where you are as well. So if you're at home, you have the most power at home. Um, if you want the funeral home to come 12 hours later, tell them that. You've been pronounced, it's, it's fine. There's nothing illegal about that. If you want the funeral home to come the following day, that's okay too. Uh, I do work with families occasionally who want to do a home funeral and they'll have a vigil at home for one, two, or three days. That takes a little bit of advanced planning and thought, but it's totally legal. So I just, yes? How, uh, how long do you have to have been on hospice care for them to actually respond? I mean, can you sign up 48 hours before the person dies? Yes, and that does happen. Sometimes people are just on hospice for a couple hours and they die right after that. Okay. Yeah. Once you're admitted under their care, does you're, it take time to get admitted? Um, where's our capital caring woman? Uh, it, I think it depends on the situation. I think it can happen pretty quickly within a matter of, you know, of, of days or weeks if you've got the right doctors on board and you qualify easily. I think there are times when it doesn't happen quite fast enough. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Why not days? A like number of days to do yeah. the bill. Yeah, I've heard about the process. What happens if you have on your license, you have a do donate. Donate, donate your parts or something? When you die, I mean, unless somebody's trying to identify you, they're not really looking at your license, your donor card. It's going to be your kin. Your next of kin are the ones who really are going to make that decision. And most of the times, um, that type of donation, not whole body donation, which we'll talk about, but organ donation, that really happens at the hospital level. Funeral homes are not typically recovering organs, corneas. They're not doing that. That happens at the hospital. Usually we see it in more of a more tragic situation. Somebody's been in a car accident. Their organs are great. They're on life support so their organs can stay alive. And then the hospital comes to them and says, we would like this, this, and this. Are you OK with that? And so next, you have no obligation, or your family has no. They obligation. have no obligation. Yeah, I mean, I think your license—it's more of like making your your um, wishes known. But in the end, it's going to be the living who makes that decision, and they're not just going to go off the license. They're going to have to get permission from your legal next of kin. Um, so, I, I like people to take their time if if they want it. Sometimes, let's say you've been taking care of your husband for seven years and you are so done. Well, you might be ready for him to be picked up right away by the funeral home. I mean, it really depends on the scenario. And there, there should be, um, you know, I just want people to know they have the right. I don't want them to feel like they have to do it. But I want them to know that the minute somebody stops breathing, you don't have to get them out of the house. If somebody wants to drive in from New York and say goodbye to them, let them. Once they're out of your house, they're out of your complete control. And so take advantage of having your person in your complete control, if, if they're lucky enough to, to be able to die at home. 
Um, if you die in a DC hospital or a Virginia hospital, your person will have, I mean, they're very flexible in DC and Virginia. It depends a little bit on where the morgue capacity is at that moment that you die. But normally a week, maybe even two weeks, they won't really force you to call the funeral home. Um, Maryland is very strict, so you have three days. If your person's in a Maryland hospital, you have 72 hours to have that person picked up and moving towards disposition. After those three days, you're going to be um, moved to the anatomy board in Maryland. Um, so DC and Virginia are a little bit more forgiving. What's the anatomy board? The state anatomy board, um, I mean, it's, it, it's where they do anatomical research. Okay. But so DC does not have a, a state okay. anatomy board. Um, Virginia does, uh, but DC does not. And you can, the DC morgue will hold people for a few weeks while families get money together or just get organized. Um, the type of funeral home you call is, it really should be reflected in, in, in what the type of service you want. If you need full staff and you need a fi nice facility and you need parking and you know you want all of the bells and whistles you might call a nicer place if you want just a simple direct cremation you don't need to spend a lot of money if you're not going to be using their facilities there's not going to be any real body preparation um, you're not going to be gathering there you don't need to spend a lot of money so DC funeral homes will I mean there are some fancy ones in upper Northwest who will Say a direct cremation is eight, nine, ten thousand dollars. You might not need that. Um, cremations in this area, um, two, three thousand. You can find some places that are closer to one thousand. But if you just want them to handle disposition, cremation only, and your family's handling memorialization or gathering, or you want to be interred at Congressional, have cremated remains interred there and gather later. You don't need to spend a lot of money on, on cremation. All right, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Does anybody have a question? So my father, when he passed away, and he had left us various instructions, and he had prepaid okay. for a cremation, and he had prepaid a funeral home for the viewing, I guess, mm -hmm. prior to yep. cremation, that was a tremendous help to us because you know, we didn't, it, it just went on autopilot. So, yeah. But, yes. Um, he, he had found the, the places that he wanted for himself. So prearrangements are, are, they could be great because there's, it's so much easier on the living, you know what they wanted, they had already picked a place, and you're just kind of following their wishes. Um, I feel like it, it depends, you know, I think another thing you can do is, is still pick your place, make your wishes known, and then put that money in an account that your family knows about. You can do that. You can kind of do your own prearrangements. Um, funeral homes, I mean, they, they will honor the prearrangements. Sometimes if certain prices have changed and it's a cash advance item, you may be paying a little bit out of pocket up front, but it's a legal document. I mean, they, they should definitely, they will honor it for sure. In Massachusetts, they yeah. paid interest every year and my father had to report it on yes. the income tax. Yes, that's right. You do. You know, we're talking $10. I know. And you never, the funeral home ends up keeping that in the end. And it's not a lot of money, but it's why they're willing to guarantee their price for 20 or 30 years. So they keep that, those bits of interest. Yeah. What's the best way to get information about the most, uh, or the best, the best prices on cremation services? I mean, there are some places where there are not nonprofit, but there, there is guidance so that you reduce the amount you spend on funerals overall, mm -hmm. so you can get advice on lower cost providers. Is that something the village does as part of their service? Make recommendations for sure. 
Uh, okay, I could, I've done a little research on this. Okay. There is a, um, a service in, I think it's Severna Park, Maryland, called Maryland Cremation Services, and uh, they will go and pick up bodies, and, and then uh, you, they can either mail you the ashes or you can go by and pick them up. Mm -hmm. And they do charge a little extra. They will arrange to get death certificates as well. And uh, that, that uh, a couple of years ago was under $900. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another service that we've got brochures on, which Lily will talk about more, but there's this um, uh, atomical uh, gift registry, and they will do free services. You basically donate your body, mm -hmm. and, and they'll do it free, and then at some point in time, I don't know how long it is, they'll return the ashes to the family. So those are my two. That's this one. Yes, that's the, yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. I, um, I'm not married. I have nine brothers and sisters. And I was told that for me to be cremated, all nine would have to agree and sign a document. Ooh. Is there some way what? to circumvent yes. <laughs> That's a great question, and it comes up all the time, uh, especially like in giant families. And in giant families, there's always Discord. <laughs> Always. Yes. Um, so because your siblings all have equal right to disposition, they would all have to sign off on cremation. Unless you name one of them as your personal representative, you know, have it in your will. This is my personal representative. I want to be cremated, and this is who I want to carry out those wishes. Then only that person has to sign. Does that person have to be a, uh, a, in line to be the survivor, or can it be somebody no. who's a friend? It could be somebody who's a friend. You can cut out all the siblings. It needs to be in your will? It doesn't have, you have to, it doesn't, it helps if it's in your will, because what happens is the funeral home will say, they don't, I'm sorry. The, the funeral home will say, can you please send us a copy of your will, and it's either the executor who's carrying out the wishes of your will, or the personal representative. If you have co a paperwork that names somebody as a personal rep, we'll take that as well. We just need a legal proof that this is the person who has the right to disposition. Is that just a, like a notarized document? Um, you, I mean, you definitely need a lawyer. You, normally it's like an estate lawyer who will draw that up for you, but yeah, it, it's not very complicated paperwork. So if you don't have children or a spouse, mm -hmm. yes. your siblings have to sign up? That That's the next in line in the hierarchy. So, so you put it in your medical health care proxy so that that person alone has the right? Um, I think the f a funeral home, they're always worried about being sued. So I would get the personal rep paperwork or have it in your will. Could we get them to my siblings to sign off now? Nope, you can't sign it in advance. <laughs> and a lot of people think they have, oh, so-and-so is my power of attorney. They can do it. Power of attorney terminates a death. So they, they think, oh, that person can do it. They're my POA, but they can't, they can't do it. Shouldn't you name one child rather than turn it over to a mess of them? So typically you name one person, and then you can name a backup person. And then... But tell your kids, you know, if they're, <laughs> tell them. For God's sake. <laughs> tell them who's doing what. Um, let's see here. So after you have been picked up, you are at the funeral home. Um, there's a couple things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what funeral homes call the arrangement conference, which is where you discuss the the what, when, where's of a funeral, if, if you're having one. Um, but some of the first information the funeral home's gonna ask you for is information for the death certificate. So um, if you keep any of this, I would just don't check page four because it's the vital statistics for death certificate, which I can send in a larger format if needed. That's the information you wanna have in your file where you say, Billy is my personal rep and he is going to sign for me to be cremated and here's my basic information. Um, you'd be surprised at how many of your kids have no idea what their grandmother's last name is. They have no idea, I don't know why, <laughs> but nobody knows that information. Because she's grandma or grand. Yeah. And their name might be different, last name might be different. That's right. 
But in one generation, we lose all kinds of basic information. So you, the information is your legal name. If you've got, some people have lots of different name situations. What is your legal name? Um, what's on your social security card? What was on your birth certificate? You know, like what, yeah, your legal name. Um, well, you. If you're a woman, often it's what's on your social security card and not your birth certificate because yeah. our names tend to change no, more. My social security card do not agree. They do not agree. Because I dropped my middle name. Yes. So I'll go with the social security card. Go with social security card. Uh, because what happens is the funeral home will run a check on your name, your date of birth, and your social security number when they go to file the death certificate, and it'll bounce back when we try to notify social security. Um, so you need your parents' names, you need your mom's maiden name, highest level of education, um, all of that information. DC makes amending a death certificate a little bit tricky. So proof it. The funeral home is going to give you a proof. Proof it. And there's a million opportunities for human error, you know, along this process. Um, what does that mean? Proof it? Proof, proof. They're going to give you a proof of the death certificate before they file it. Oh. They will give you, this is a proof of what we're going to oh, file oh, with oh. D.C. So or Maryland. Right? Yeah, proof. Oh, okay. Yes. So proof it carefully and, you know, try to give accurate information up front. Um, Maryland makes it easy to amend. Virginia makes it very difficult. It normally involves driving to Virginia, uh, or to Virginia, to Richmond. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most people get about 10 death certificates. Um, not every financial institution will insist on having an original. A lot of times a bank will make a copy, give it back to you. But if you have property to transfer, if you have a life insurance policy, um, pension, 401k, a lot of those will insist on having an original. Some people need 15 or 20. Most people need somewhere around 10 or a little bit less. It's gotten a little bit better during COVID. More institutions are just asking for a PDF to be uploaded as opposed to being mailed in. Any questions? I'm still floored on the sibling signing off. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. They don't answer their names. I'm sitting around for months. <laughs> but if you've picked one, and it's yes, well, I've got to go. It's another document to go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's good. Good to do it now. If you're doing a more traditional funeral, when you go to the funeral home, um, you know you're going to be talking about the funeral service itself. If it's going to be at a place of worship, if you're going to have an open casket or a closed casket, if there's going to be body prepara preparation like embalming. Um, you might be bringing clothing and jewelry that you want if you're doing the full, the full thing. Um, you might be selecting flowers. And uh, payment is often expected. It's at least expected before burial or cremation occurs if you, know, you don't have it with you at that first conference. If, um, if you're going the direct cremation route, I just want people to know my, my dad, his second year, to his death anniversary is coming up and he technically just had a direct cremation but it was so lovely and so meaningful and I just want people to know that they can they can make it meaningful even though the disposition part is simple and you don't have that much going on with the funeral home that doesn't mean that you can't do things that make it special um, so my dad got to die at home on hospice care and we all got to be with him and you know we dressed him and we gave him his final bath and we had a really sweet service this is down in atlanta at a natural burial ground there um, he was cremated um, but there's lots of ways to make what is technically a direct cremation feel special during covid i had people all over the country that couldn't travel to be with their people and you can still do this even now, things that are, are better. Um, have people write letters, have children do drawings, and you can tuck their pockets with letters and drawings and notes. I've had people be blanketed in words and memories from their loved ones 
just for a direct cremation. So I think there's lots of ways you can make it sweet, um, that it, ma it makes it feel more meaningful. You can send flowers from your garden with them, send them with something that they loved. What um, do you mean by direct cremation? What that means, great question, I'm sorry I didn't answer that. That just means the funeral home is, is picking you, they're picking you up, they're gonna cremate you, they'll file the death certificate, and then they're giving the cremated remains to your family or the person designated to come and pick up. So there's no funeral service involved. It's, they're just handling the disposition of your body. And normally it's the most affordable. So you mean they'll take the body with the clothes or with the letters or with the flowers? Or you can have them bring them by later if you don't have it all together at that time. You know, it depends on how quickly. Normally a couple days after somebody dies, they're, they're cremated. In D.C., it's normally a couple days longer because the medical examiner approves every cremation in the district. <laughs> and they, if they don't like the order or the cause of death was written in, then they'll have to send it back to the doctor. Then it can take a few days. D.C. has really got their hands on every cremation. In Maryland, it can happen the next day. Um, in Virginia, the medical examiner comes out, but it's literally a medical examiner comes by the funeral home, takes a look at the person and makes sure it looks like they didn't have a fall or that nothing else was going on. And D.C., you're much more caught up in the bureaucracy of D.C., and we know as D.C. residents how that goes. Um, did you have a question? Okay. Okay, so we already talked a little bit about making a direct cremation meaningful. Um, and I, I know we are probably running short on time, so I think we should start moving. I think this is not a heavy embalming crowd, if I'm guessing right. Not into that? No. Okay. No, so, <laughs> embalming, I will say, it buys you time. If you need to be shipped overseas, it's comes in handy. Um, or if you're going to be buried at Arlington Cemetery and you need six to nine months before you can get your name called, um, there are times when it's very necessary. And, and in some communities, it's, you know, it's what people expect and want. So that's what I'll say about embalming. It's not always bad. And if you've had a really tragic death, sometimes it can really st restore somebody in a way that is very healing for their family. Um, but if you can avoid putting all those chemicals in the ground, it's a great thing. So whole body donation is different from organ donation. This is really a form of disposition. So instead of being buried in con at Congressional or having a direct cremation, whole body donation, you are literally giving your whole body to a medical school or in Maryland, the State Anatomy Board. In D.C., Howard University and Georgetown will do whole body donation. You should get registered ahead of time. They can technically refuse accepting your body at the time of death. So with whole body donation, you need to have a backup plan. You just need to have a backup plan. There was times during COVID they weren't accepting because there was so much fear in the very beginning. Um, if, for example, I had a woman maybe a month ago or so, um, this was a woman who had planned whole body donation. She lived on the Maryland side. She fell down some steps. She was taken to Sibley. Mm -hmm. And um, the Maryland State Anatomy Board did not want to accept her body, but also the DC medical examiner had, had taken her. Because of the fall, she ended up with the medical examiner and we thought she had an autopsy. She did not in the end, they just examined her. But if you have an autopsy, and even if you're not planning on having an autopsy, that rules out body donation for you. So you need to have a backup plan. And I've um, learned at a previous one of these sessions that if yeah. you died during the summer when the medical school was not in center, they wouldn't take your body. There you go. Because they didn't want to keep it for the summer. Yeah. Wow. So die in winter. <laughs> Why does an autopsy? Because because a, it was because she fell down the steps. Oh. Yep, it was because it was an unexpected, unplanned, un unnatural okay. death. So they took they took her, but they decided not to do the autopsy, which was the blessing, because she 
I made the Maryland State Anatomy Board take her. <laughs> they didn't want to take her. They were like, oh, we don't like dealing with DC bodies because the DC medical examiner makes it so much harder. Um, but they, they took her in the end. Well, I, I, I thought he had asked why, why the anatomy board wouldn't take a body that had been oh, autopsied. Oh, autopsied, because, I mean, it's really for their, it's for medical schools to learn the anatomy of the body, and if you've had an autopsy, uh, nothing is in the right place anymore, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to have an autopsy. <laughs> you don't want to have one. If you don't need one, you don't want to have one. It's not a pretty process. My son teaches on anatomy in a medical school. He appreciated your donations. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important. Very important. So in D.C., Howard and Georgetown, um, on the Maryland side, there's the Maryland State Anatomy Board, and then there's um, Uniformed Services, which is basically a medical school for the military. They also take body donations. Um, in Virginia, they have an anatomical program as well. But be registered, but also have a backup plan, because there are things that happened unplanned. Um, yes? With her, I heard that it can take some, quite some time between the time that the body's donated and you get back the cremated ashes. It yes. It can take quite a while. Oftentimes, uh, it can be about a year. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Um, after you go to, let's say, a medical school, uh, you are going to be embalmed because they have to preserve your body in order to be able to, um, to study it. So they have to keep you preserved. And after they are done with that course of study, which could be months and months, um, at some point you'll be cremated after that. And then um, it depends on the program, but most of the time cremated remains would then be returned to the family after that but it could it could be about a year so you just have to make sure you're on, on board with that whole process but it is a hugely generous thing to do with yourself um, Any yes idea how uh, limited bodies are for medical is there a, a need for bodies uh, I yes from what I hear yes absolutely yeah He's going to change his mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, water cremation, it has about five different names. Green cremation, aquamation, alkaline hydrolysis. Um, this is something I'm really interested in. So many people in this area have an interest in, in cremation because it doesn't take up space, but they don't like the idea of all of the carbon that goes into the air during the cremation process. It is big in lots of parts of the US. Um, it is legal in Maryland on the books, but currently nobody offers it. But we'll talk a little bit about the process of it. Um, the closest place from here that offers it is North Carolina. There's tons of it in Florida, a bunch in uh, Minnesota, Texas. There's, I mean, it's, it's in, all over the US, just not in these parts yet. Uh, that image is a good image of a traditional alkaline hydrolysis machine, that kind of stainless steel um, tank. It is not the warmest looking process, <laughs> but it's mostly water. It's about 95% water and then a 5% alkali, kind of a lye solution that helps speed up breaking down your body. Um, and there is some pressure in most of these machines. The water is around 300 degrees. A traditional crematory is more like 16, 17, 1800 degrees. Um, so it's a gentler process. It takes a little bit longer. Normal cremation, um, like two to three hours, and then you have a little bit of a cooling off period. This depends on your sh machine. I think it's more of like a four to six, seven, our position or the time frame there. Um, you have a much smaller footprint. If anybody has watched Katrina Spade's TED Talk or learned a little bit about the um, natural organic reduction, which we'll talk about because Bill wants to talk about that. 
what she says is many of, for most of us, some of the last things we'll do will be to pollute <laughs> the earth, which is true, which is true. And uh, that's a, a harsh reality to think about with cremation. Um, this would be a great alternative for people who want cremation who don't want the carbon that goes along with it. Uh, in the end, are the costs about the same? The cost, most in places where this is offered, people try to match because they just they want people to go with the water and and not have it cost more than the fire. Um, in the end, your family would still be given cremated remains. They're more like a powdery white color. They're less kind of ashy looking. And you get more cremated remains because uh, you're, you're left with more of the bones of the body because it is gentler. So the cremation, fire cremation process is so much hotter temperature, it breaks, breaks more of you down. Um, so keep your eyes out. I'm hoping there's something on the horizon coming in that area for us around here. Yeah, because your body would have to be embalmed to go to North Carolina or some other state to be water cremated, wouldn't it? Well, no. Domestically, if you're if you're moving people domestically, um, you do not have to be embalmed. But if you go international, unless you're going to Israel, you have to be embalmed. I have sent people all over the world, uh, which is also fascinating. We can talk about that. Um, so home funerals, we'll touch on this because you guys are more of a, a green burial uh, crowd. Home, this is, it's really a special way to go out if, if it's the right scenario for your family. Typically this is somebody who knows their terminal and this is something that they really want. Um, but your family has to be on board because not everybody is going to be comfortable with having their person you know, laid out at home for that amount of time. Uh, I have been involved in a home funeral before and it was pretty amazing. Um, this was a woman in her late 40s who um, had terminal cancer and her family and, and she really wanted that. And so I helped get her home and she had this amazing wicker casket, and she was there for three days with family and friends coming out, coming in and out, um, just being with her body, you know, sitting vigil with the body, sharing stories, crying, singing, talking, laughing, eating together. It is, uh, it's, it's, death can feel so, I feel like there's so much frenzy for people so often. Like the minute somebody stops breathing, you feel like, I gotta get them out of the house, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. And this is a much slower, kinder way to get used to the idea that that person is no longer there. Did she have to be embalmed first? Nope. Oh, okay. Nope, she was, ba I, I bathed it was her. summer in DC with that. Actually it was summer in DC and I was worried about that. Um, and also um, her end, she thought she was gonna get to die at home and she didn't. And so that was a little bit more complicated. I had to get her, getting somebody out of Georgetown is always complicated. Um, and they make it so hard. So um, I was worried about that. And then also when somebody's been in the hospital, a lot of times they have so much extra fluid in their body because they're on fluids. Mm -hmm. And um, you just, you, it feels like there's less out of your control. You don't know how their body's gonna hold up when there's, sometimes people are just really swollen with fluids that have been pumped through at the hospital level. So that changes, you know, if people are leaky or, you know, it changes people's comfort level um, big time. But I was worried about all of that, um, but it all, it all worked out. <laughs> but lots of ice packs that you have to change out. You wanna keep the body cold. You're changing out ice packs all the time, every few hours. Um, everybody's on fly duty. If there's a fly in the house, you kill it. And um, wow. and you know, it's it's a it's not for everybody. But if you can do it, it's pretty special time, I think. It is. It was the norm. It was the norm. Until recently. It was the norm. Yeah, until the Civil War. 
in Lincoln. Now, I remember it when I was about 10, 12 years old, a neighbor. Yeah. And they laid him out right in his bed. Yeah. That's I think it's really nice. I mean, I have two little girls. I always think, and I hope never, but if I lost a child, I think I'd want to bring them home. I'd want them at home with me. You know, I wouldn't be ready to say goodbye to their body that quickly, even though, you know, we say, well, it's their spirit, it's not connected, but I think I would, I would want them home. Yeah. Now, are there rules about green burial? Um, can you just go out in your backyard and you can't go in your backyard um, unless, well, unless you've got like property out somewhere. Uh, so technically, but not in DC. They don't want you in your yard in DC. Bless you, <laughs> So green burial. <laughs> I, I have no idea how we are for time. Okay, I guess I'm, all right, we better hurry up. So green burial, I guess everybody should know it's not cheaper. <laughs> People think it's cheaper. It's not cheaper. The funeral home will still manage to make their money on the green burial. Um, you're not embalmed. The funeral home will still charge you almost identically for bathing that they will for embalming. But they would bathe you. Your family could ask to come in. If you want, you could come in and help bathe your person if you wanted to. You could say they've already been bathed. You could also say they've already been bathed. But if you say, now I want you to dress them in this outfit, then the funeral home will say, well, we have to bathe them in order to dress them. Which is why if your person dies at home, why give them a, if they're on hospice care, they're probably pretty clean. You can give them a final wipe down and dress them. and. Um, that is a real way to save money with the funeral home. So do some of that stuff at, at home if you can, you know, if, it, if, if you can, depending on the emotional situation and the physical situation. Um, yeah, so you could have a funeral home then just pick up and basically you're just having them for transport, filing the death certificate, getting a burial transit permit, um, ordering the casket. You can also get your own casket legally. Funeral homes don't like it, but you can get your own casket. You can have it shipped to the funeral home. They have to accept it. They're not allowed to charge you a corkage fee. Uh, so <laughs> so that, that's another option. It's amazing how much the cost of plain pine boxes have gone up the past couple of years, but um, you could build your own. You know, you there's there's other options. At a very so great question. At a very cool cemetery like Congressional, which is one of the reasons I love it and have always loved it, they will let you go just shrouded. Now the funeral home will say, well, we still need a minimum transport container, which is basically a very sturdy cardboard box, and you could say, okay, fine, bring them in that, and then you could lift them out of it at at the cemetery, so Congressional will let you just be shrouded with no vault, no grave liner. Um, they will even let you do it without a lowering device. They would even just lower you with ropes. I've been to a service like that, which was very cool. Um, most cemeteries aren't like Congressional, so um, like Congressional is considered a hybrid because people can go there embalmed and have a, you know, a liner and do the full traditional funeral thing, but the person buried next to them could be totally green. True green, green cemeteries, we can, uh, actually have to skip ahead one more, because that's all Congressional, I love Congressional. In the area, you're a little limited, but out in Berryville, Virginia, there is a monk run cemetery called Cool Springs Natural Cemetery. And uh, it's beautiful. It's, you know, you're driving out towards the Shenandoahs. It's very peaceful. It's a little bit of a haul from here, but it's special when you get there. Um, that is a green, green cemetery. Uh, and there's different levels of green. So some green cemeteries will say you can't even have a marker. Or some will say, okay, well, you can have a rock with your name on it. That's where you are. So it depends on how green you want to be. But your casket, 
your body cannot be prepared, your casket must be natural, your clothing, if you're wearing clothing, must be natural fibers as well. Um, there's, yes? It seems like eventually there's going to be some subsidence. Does the cemetery take care of that or the, the grounds going to? Oh yeah, I mean congressional grounds, they're like, yeah, yeah they're a, But they don't, they, they don't do anything. Nope, they don't do anything. No. But if you go, you know, normal cemeteries, the reason they are perfectly flat is because there's right. so much right. cement and metal underneath the ground there. And yeah. And, and you, those backhoes weigh several thousand pounds that they use to dig the holes. So if you don't have all that support underground, it's bumpy. And, but that's how congressional is, and that's why we love it, right? I mean, that's how, how I think of it. Is it complicated to, I guess, in D.C. to be buried in, in, in Virginia? Virginia? No, it's not. Not at all. You would just get your, your funeral home, will get you the burial transit permit, and you'll be riding out to Virginia. Yeah. Virginia has a couple nice options. Um, Duck Run is a neat option. They have what's called um, renewal grave sites which I think are neat. I think they could be tweaked a little, and I don't know if it's a nature of Virginia state law, but a renewal site is a site that you don't own forever. So I think at that particular cemetery, you have that site for 75 years. Now, it doesn't take 75 years for somebody's body to completely break down to be able to use that space again. I really like the idea of a renewal lot. Um, I'd love to know what the DC rules are to see if we could do something like that at Congressional. I think that would be neat, especially. No stones, no markers. Depends. This one I can't remember offhand, but each one is slightly different. Some will say no markers, and some will say a very natural <laughs> marker that you could maybe have engraved. Like the, the cemetery where my dad is, is also a monk run cemetery, and he has a stone that's engraved just over where he is. <laughs> Um, there's another one outside of Roanoke, Forest Rest, and this is the same idea. This one says natural marker, um, natural caskets, shrouding, no embalming. And then I keep keeping my eye, are you okay? No, 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 um, it's going to be like 40 acres of a natural burial ground close in, which would be very cool. Mm -hmm. I think it's taken them a lot longer to get their permitting together than they anticipated. Um, so it keeps saying 2022. I just checked their website yesterday to see if there was any updates. Now it just says late 2022. Mm -hmm. but I think this could be a really neat option close in for people. I'm, I'm excited for that. So go to Reflection Park. They have a, you can get on their email list and it's supposed to be trails, meditation space, and natural burial ground, which would be really neat. And then finally, <laughs> Bill, <laughs> we have natural organic reduction, which is the only reason that Bill is here. Um, this was started by uh, a woman named Katrina Spade who was studying architecture and started thinking about end of life and she designed a vessel um, that will basically break down your body completely there's no bones or teeth left um, within 30 days um, and then your body becomes soil and the soil can be donated to a forest or given back to the family. It's a lot of soil. It's like a truck bed of soil. Oh, so, wow. yeah. Vermont. <laughs> or to Vermont. <laughs> but is there real soil in it, or is it just you? There is soil. I, there is soil in it. There is soil. They add a lot of straw and alfalfa and and soil. The vessels kept at a very specific. So you have real compost. Yeah, it's real. It is real compost. It is real compost. Um, they, sorry, go ahead. Does somebody have a question? Uh, yes. Um, they use a lot of aeration. You know, so this system is taking advantage of all of our body's microbes, our gut bacteria that is just waiting to 
break us all down. The minute we stop breathing, our gut bacteria just go to work on us. And so um, this takes advantage of that. Well, it's supposedly safe to put on vegetables, too. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Currently, when you read through their rules, it says the soil is supposed to be placed in an area where there's non-edible plants. I don't, no, I don't understand. that's Some of the states are saying now you can put it in. I, I'm glad that you're seeing that because I was, it didn't really but you make say sense. it's a lot of soil. It's a lot of soil. So, for example, um, Oregon, Washington State, and I don't, I think it's officially on the books in Colorado now. Um, and then coming, um, oh, I did list where it was coming. Vermont. Vermont is on the books. Yeah, it's coming. There's legis legislation introduced in Hawaii, Delaware, Maine. Hang in there. I put Oregon again, <laughs> New York and Vermont. But you see, you can take a body. You could. You swear to have this done. You could. Mary can drive it. You could fly. You could fly a, a body. Uh, you could. You could fly a body there. It'll be. I don't know how. How you think? You think it takes a, a truck to carry the volume? The, no, no, no. It takes it takes the remains. The results. The results. You you end up with it says like a truck bed of soil. It's a lot of soil. To get it done, you're gonna you're gonna take the body up to Vermont. Yeah. Get it done up there. Soil there too. Yeah. For oh. So 30 days. You say. So so just if anybody's interested, on that computer over there, I brought a tape, a video. It's not the greatest video in the world of a service that was done in Seattle, mm. and the woman who does it, it's, it's a it's very touchy feely, um, Zen, whatever you want to call it, but they spread straw and stuff like that on the body. And then they show in the film, they show the body moving into a, um, the body's in a shroud, moves into, I guess I'm going to call it a composting tumbler. <laughs> it is and, a tumbler. They call it a, a vessel. Tumbler, and, it's, and they show you where there's so like three foot diameter opening and then they put the cover back on and then the woman talks about on this clip about what happens. It's about 30 days and there in this composting operation out of Seattle, then takes the remains of what's there, or the new compost, to a mountain they own, or they have a, a conservatory that's in the southern part of the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and it, it's basically return, it's called returning to the earth, is what they call the service. Mm -hmm. So if people are interested, we can show it. <laughs> That's a good question. Maybe you. So it's in two thousand twenty two. Sorry, Um so I, I don't know. I was gonna just leave it open for questions in these last couple of minutes, but have your plan. Tell your people. If you need to appoint somebody, appoint them. Um, communicate it. Tell people where your file is. Get your vital statistic information on a sheet so nobody's looking for it. Um, you don't have to necessarily prepay with a funeral home. You can, but you can also just have a really good idea about it, what you want and, and write it down. So, so yeah. you can call the Congressional Cemetery and say, I would like to have Space for a green burial here. And, oh, yeah. Then what happens? So we would take you out um, to, to look at different sites. And you know you can pre-purchase the site. And then when the time comes, depending on the site, like some people have cremation sites. Um, if you buy a, if you're, I don't know if you're in the cremation category or not. I can't remember. But I if, don't know either. OK. So um, if you buy a traditional burial site, you can fit lots of cremated remains there. Um, you could fit a combination of uh, a body, two bodies, and cremated remains. Yep. Um, there's columbarium there, too, as well. But yes, you could come out, and we can look at different sites that are available. Yeah, if you're interested. Yeah. Yes, if you did the prepaid, I was recently going to do all of it, do the prepay, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want my daughter to have to think. Um, and, um, but then I travel a lot, and then I got worried, well, what if I prepay in mm -hmm. D.C., mm -hmm. but I'm in whatever. Yep. Um, 
How's that accommodating? So a funeral home will try, well, they, they'll offer you something that's called like out of state coverage for an extra amount, which means if you happen to die when you're on a trip somewhere, mm -hmm. that's back. covered, they'll get you back here. But the other thing is that um, most of the time, a funeral home, like you just, that policy would just be transferred to the funeral home who's performing those services. And so even, pay yes, more right. So whatever you would put aside for that funeral home, uh, it would be, because it's either going to be in an insurance policy or it's going to be in a trust account, and it could be transferred to the funeral home that's performing the services. Um, if you end up with a funeral home that's more expensive than what you had pre-planned for, you could end up, there could be a balance due, but it, it should be transferred. Funeral homes accept those types of funds all the time when that happens. I will say, if you die overseas and they need to fly your body back, it is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Yes. So be cremated if you <laughs> die overseas because yeah, mm -hmm. bringing a body back is very expensive. Very yes. Expensive. We got a lot of people poking their hands in. Oh, like okay. I think it's, I think it's, yeah. oh. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.